In late 1976, the Sex Pistols gave the style known as punk rock its first major instance of mainstream attention. Unsurprisingly, it wasn't positive attention. Not that that would have bothered the band or their manager Malcolm McLaren, but the furor pressured their original record label EMI to drop them from their roster in early 1977. But this didn't mean that EMI was discouraged from punk entirely, as later that year they signed Wire after the decent performance on the album charts of the live punk compilation The Roxy London WC2, which featured Wire as an unsigned band. Wire is a London band formed by Colin Newman, Graham Lewis, Bruce Gilbert and Robert Gray, or Robert Gotobed as he used to be credited. They formed out of an enthusiasm for the growing punk scene, but their sound goes much further than just punk. Some people consider them as art punk, partly because three of the band's form members had all studied at different art schools, but also because they aimed to forge their own path while surrounded by more straightforward punk bands. Wire did have some of punk's common musical traits, but they came with the desire to push themselves and sound as little like their peers as possible. If punk was a reaction to what was happening in society, then perhaps Wire was a reaction to punk itself. The band introduced themselves with three brilliant albums in three years, predicting the future of post-punk and elements of new wave, hardcore punk, and gothic rock along the way. The first of this brilliant debut trio of albums was Pink Flag, released just a month after the Sex Pistols' landmark Nevermind the Bollocks album in 1977. Pink Flag's first two tracks alone are a pretty good indicator of how unpredictable Wire were. The opening track, Reuters, is a deadly serious dirge with angry guitars and violent lyrics about unrest creating a tense three minutes. And the following track, Field Day for the Sundays, is a bouncy stop-start track that's all over in less than 30 seconds. Pink Flag crams 21 songs into a 36-minute album, with an average song length of about a minute and a half, and only three of the songs go over the three-minute mark. In punk, this usually suggests that the songs are being played at breakneck speed, but while some of the songs were on the quicker side, this wasn't necessarily the case with Y. Right from the get-go, even as they were still refining their musical skills, the band showcased their key strength. They could create songs that stick in your head despite either their short length or their minimal chord and note structures. They often balanced this out with subtle changes to the standard three chord punk formula like the lilting rhythm of three girl rumba and the dissonance that creeps in towards the end of 106 beats that, while others just rely on sheer anger like Mr. Suit and 12XU, a song that was apparently a big influence in the Washington DC hardcore scene first being covered by the band Minor Threat. And then there's the slower tracks, like the previously mentioned Reuters, the uneasy lurch of Lowdown, and the title track, which largely chugs along on the same chord but then accelerates to a chaotic end. Another bonus of this album is that the guitars are pretty fierce. In fact, especially on the slower tracks, at times they sound downright sludgy. That's a word you probably wouldn't have heard from music reviewers in the 70s. But that's wire for you. And after all this, there's some much more poppy moments. You've got X Lion Tamer with its fairly conventional four chord pop progression, Mannequin, which has some of the album's most bitter lyrics, but the song itself feels more jaunty with the distortion toned down and added wordless harmonies. And Fragile is stripped back to the point where it feels like it falls under just basic indie pop. So that's what you get with Pink Flag a band that is still raw yet managed to cover plenty of ground with the giddiness and enthusiasm that often goes into recording a debut album. The only real downside is that some of the shorter tracks are a little easy to forget about, but nothing here really fails, especially when you take the album as a whole. So that was my introduction to Wire, and I did quite enjoy it, though I think it took me nearly two years before I decided to check out their second album, 1978's Chairs Missing. And it really makes me want to ask myself, why the fuck did I wait this long? Hearing the first three songs on Chairs Missing was quite a head fuck. A watery bass line introduces the album and its first track, Practice Makes Perfect, giving way to constant thudding guitars and Robert Gray's minimal percussion. It builds in intensity before gradually dispersing, similar to what Reuters did at the start of Pink Flag. Only this time it's punctuated by synthesizers and a level of effects processing that definitely wasn't on the first album. On the second track, French Film Blurred, the band suddenly takes a turn into psychedelic pop with shimmering guitars and Newman singing in a rather soft voice for the first time. Even on Pink Flag's songs like Fragile, he sounded like he was singing through a snarl. And that's followed by Another The Letter, a minute of flurried lyrics over stiff metronomic rhythms and a busy modulating synth. It sounds like it wouldn't be too out of place with early 2000s indie, so I guess why I predicted both post-punk and post-punk revival. Chairs Missing is a massive step in Wire's evolution, as Mike Thorne, the producer of Wire's first three albums, becomes a sort of unofficial fifth member, as he added a lot more to the production side of things and played the keyboards that Wire introduced to their sound for the first time. His keyboard playing never really takes
takes a proper lead role on the album, instead focusing on drones and background noise to add a whole new dimension of colour to Wise sound. And with all the effects he was adding, sometimes the difference between guitar and synth is nearly indistinguishable. And the band themselves also started experimenting with guitar pedals, which is how Newman got his guitar to sound like a malfunctioning transformer in the intro of I Am The Fly. Interestingly, on Pink Flag, Bruce Gilbert was the sole guitarist on all but two tracks, so Chairs Missing marks some big changes in the roles of each member as he and Newman team up on guitars for most songs. Bassist Graham Lewis also makes his lead songwriting and vocal debut on the track Sand My Joints, a song that retains much of the Pink Flag spirit, until the frazzled dual guitar solo that is. <laughs> The album is also home to Outdoor Minor, the band's most notable song as it came agonisingly close to giving Wire a hit single. Not hard to hear why, with its glistening guitars and a pleasant approach to songwriting rather than their usual attempt to assault the senses. The Outdoor Minor single reached 51 on the UK chart, after which the band were invited to perform on famed British music program Top of the Pops, but only if the song climbed up the chart the following week. And it probably would have, except that EMI were caught buying multiple copies of the single from stores, something that most record labels did back then according to Mike Thorne, and that led to the single being removed from the chart the following week, thus denying Wire their Top of the Pops performance. But they still found their audience, so I guess it's alright. And back to the rest of the album. A mix of hacking and slashing guitars and ghostly synth drones creates an anxious atmosphere on standout tracks Marooned and Being Sucked In Again, the latter with some infectious drumming from Grey. Then there's Heartbeat, which greatly contrasts the rest of the album with sparse instrumentation and barely their dynamics. So of course they immediately follow it with Mercy, their most aggressive song yet. Five and a half minutes of hard-hitting power chords and drums. I Feel Mysterious today has choppy guitar and quirky percussion that reminds me of the album Crazy Rhythms by The Feelies, released two years later. The song Used To has a big buzzing lead line but still has more of a dreamy feel as the vocals and drumming are more subdued once again. And the album closes with a good old fashioned rock and roll blowout in the form of Too Late. The only song that feels like it might be a bit below par is From The Nursery because it does a lot of the stuff that Practice Makes Perfect already did at the start of the album. But Chairs Missing really is a stellar album. It showcases the band's increased ambition and confidence, polishing their sound without losing their raw power. In fact, it probably increases it, if anything. And Mike Thorne's production and synths take the album to riveting places that none of their peers were visiting. If this album isn't widely regarded as a landmark album in the vast world of punk yet, then it bloody well should be. Hell, even a landmark album in general. Can't think of many other landmark releases from 1978. 1979, however, was a pretty big year for punk and especially post-punk, with bands like Joy Division and Gang of Four emerging. And despite other bands catching up with Wire and effectively establishing post-punk as a genre, the band still stayed unique with their third album, 154. The album takes its name from the estimated amount of live shows that the band had played at that point. And if you're wondering where the names of the first two albums came from, Chairs Missing comes from some British slang for someone who's mentally unstable. And Pink Flag, Okay, that one's probably self-explanatory. So as the origin of the album title suggests, Wire were a much more experienced band when they were making 154. If they had a motto while they were working on this album, then it might have been something like Go Big or Go Home, because it expands and one-ups a lot of things on Chairs Missing. There's more additional instruments, more of Lewis and Gilbert's songwriting, and even more of Mike Thorne's involvement, both in his transformative production and his keyboards taking much less of a background role. It had their most powerful vocal melodies, and also some of their darkest, most harrowing moments yet. It managed to be both their most polished album and their most experimental album simultaneously. The only thing 154 doesn't seem to have is anything that sounds like typical punk. Instead, its sound feels like it makes bigger strides towards new wave and gothic rock. The song On Returning pairs Newman's playful vocals with chaotic synth stabs that eventually take over the entire song, portraying Wire as British cousins of Devo or the B-52s, whilst the rigid rhythm and multiple percussive layers of a single KO feel reminiscent of Talking Heads. Lewis's compositions I Should Have Known Better and A Touching Display bring most of the gothic brooding, with Should Have Known combining his emotive baritone vocal with Grey's steady hi-hat rolling and Thorne's spacious synths into something that doesn't sit firmly in either New Wave or goth rock. Meanwhile, a touching display is tense and sprawling, clocking in at nearly seven minutes, and is more of a predecessor of The Cure's confronting 1982 album Pornography, with Lewis taking the lead with both vocals and bass, accompanied by an otherworldly drone, created by an electric viola, of all things. And the whole second half of the song is a massively distorted high note bass solo, 
Not a guitar as I thought the first few times I heard it. So yeah, it's pretty full on. The songs Two People in a Room and Once is Enough come closest to Wire's earlier punk roots, but Two People feels more spiky compared to anything on Pink Flag with its shotgun blast snares and guitars that constantly dig away, and Once is Enough has a prominent bass riff and booming drums that remind me more of early U2, albeit a much heavier version. And it also ends with Lewis smashing bits of sheet metal with a hammer. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that was ever particularly U2's style. 154 also has two Bruce Gilbert compositions that are vastly different from each other. Blessed State, which was sung by Lewis, feels like Gilbert's attempt at writing Outdoor Minor 2, except that it takes one melodic phrase and effectively repeats it for the whole duration of the song. Still pleasant enough, but far from new ground for the band. But his second offering, The Other Window, is certainly Wire's most experimental recording, at least at that time, with Gilbert performing a mix of spoken word and below average singing over some wonky guitar and bass noises, while Newman cuts in with an ominous vocal line that makes the whole thing feel like it's giving exposition in some creepy musical. And unfortunately when the drums finally come in, they're effectively not synced up with anything else in the song. So yeah, it's a bit of a near avant-garde clusterfuck. I guess I still enjoy it somewhat, but yeah, mixed feelings. Thankfully, Newman makes up for this by showing his knack for writing killer vocal lines. This first shows up on the song The 15th, which has its similarities with Outdoor Minor as well, but is delivered in a much more dreamy fashion with jangly lead guitars, warm floaty synths, and rhythm guitars that lightly chug along, giving it a sort of proto-shoegaze feel even. And on A Mutual Friend and Map Ref 41, he shifts into vocal overdrive, with triple harmonies and his most powerful emotional singing yet. Though it is a slow build up to that point on A Mutual Friend, starting off more deadpan with a thudding instrumental, though in the middle it does suddenly cut away to some more angelic vocals, so to speak. And if you thought the electric viola was weird, well this part is accompanied by a core anglais. So yeah, the band was certainly big on exploring new textures in their sound for this album. Another case in point, the guitars on Map Ref 41 are just completely wigged out, slathered in effects. Whereas the vocals are just constantly soaring pop. Anytime Newman does those harmonies and he goes to the super high notes, it's just glorious. Interrupting my train of lines. However, that track is immediately followed by Indirect Inquiries, possibly the darkest track on this album. With very little percussion, it instead focuses on this nasty main riff and Newman's slightly creepy spoken word with occasional singing. It's a testament to how engaging Newman could be as a singer, or more as a performer since he wasn't singing all the time. And the end of that song borders on sensory overload, as the song's final lyric is repeated by what appears to be about a dozen different layers of Newman's voice at various levels of pitch and intensity and different playback speeds. And that's followed by the album closer, 40 Versions, which isn't quite as full on as the track that comes before it, though it does have some kind of Joy Division vibes with its fuzzy bass, spooky synths, and everything just having a decent amount of reverb put on it. Incidentally, the first line of that song is, I never know which version I'm going to be which I think is a pretty good summary of the whole of 154. Each song seems to contradict the one that comes before or after it. And while the album does have a little bit of consistency issues, that really only matters in comparison to Chairs Missing, because this is still a pretty mind-blowing album. Both those albums are. Some people would add Pink Flag to the mix, but personally, I just don't really feel it as much as the other two. Still, it's plenty of fun, and like the other two albums, it demonstrates just how innovative and forward-thinking Wire were. Whenever they did something that sounded like one of their contemporaries, it sounded more like a group of alien musicians trying to fit in with the world. They started off with the basic punk blueprint, but expanded on it massively. And they explored a whole range of moods, styles, and textures, despite coming across as like they are in their own bubble compared to the rest of the music world. And with the amount of musical exploration and genre bending they did compared to the level of popularity they've found so far. I think Wire put forward a pretty good case for being the most underrated band of the original UK punk wave. Unfortunately 154 was effectively the last release of Phase 1 of Wire. Tensions started rising during the making of that album, which I think you can hear in just how complex the album is and also how detailed the songwriting credits are for each song. After a bunch of disastrous live shows that were apparently more focused on performance art than the music people were familiar with Wire for, as heard on their 1981 live album Document and Eyewitness, the band went their separate ways and focused on solo stuff. However, they did reconvene in 1985, and since then they've released 
13 studio albums, and they've still remained elusive and unique along the way. So it's a pretty interesting trajectory, even if their debut trio was their peak in the eyes of a lot of people. And I'm sure I'll dive deeper into their massive discography in due time. So do yourself a favour and listen to this band, because they kick ass. Thank you for watching. We'll be right back.